thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction, and thank you for inviting me, both of you. I actually hid a glass of water here earlier, and I'm kind of smart, actually. Um, first of all, I don't have any conflicts of interest, but if, if anyone here sits on a bag of money and wants to give them to me, uh, you can have your name displayed <laughs> up here next year. Um, but on a more serious note, I'm here to talk about um, the survivors. This is a sepsis patient from our ward. This is the same patient a few weeks later, a few kilos later. Um, and we have a problem, and he's got a problem, and his family has got a problem. And the problem <coughs> is that today we do not have a single proper way of measuring what survivorship actually means to the survivors. What we do is we hand out the SF36 or the EQ5D or any other scale that we use. We collect them within the first year. Uh, they fill it in. We send it to the registries, and then we're happy about that. And that's not enough. And Janet has already shown us this fantastic study by Lim and Catherine Rowan. What they did was they interviewed about 30 ICU survivors, and they extracted every single symptom or disability or problem that they had. And then they categorized these symptoms into these chapters or domains or whatever you want to call it. And then they, ha they handed the SF36 and the EQ5D to the same patients and asked them, how well do you think that the SF or the EQ uh, covers your problems? And this is the results, and I'll, I'll explain it. As you can see in the physical status, the green ones, these survivors said that the SF and the EQ was satisfactory covering issues regarding physical status. That was okay. But when we come to the yellow ones, these four, four chapters, what the survivors said was that the SF and the EQ does not cover these issues sufficiently. It's not enough. And the red ones, these are areas where the SF and the EQ, they don't even have questions about that. And these are issues measured high, ranked high by the survivors. So we don't have a proper way of measuring what they want to tell us. Indeed, the conclusion that they made was that uh, there is a strong case for development of an of a ICU-specific questionnaire. And that's what we have been trying to, to, to do. What we did is that we interviewed 30, 30 ICU survivors during one year. We tried, just as they did, to extract every single issue, problem, uh, disability, dysfunction, everything they had. We transformed this into separate questions. We then handed out this preliminary questionnaire to uh, a new group of ICU survivors, uh, asked them for feedback. We handed it out to medical expertise within certain areas. And what we found was these areas. And as you can see, it's basically the same as the one that uh, Lim and Rowan found. We also added a few questions about the questionnaire in itself. Things like, uh, was there any question that made you feel uncomfortable? Uh, a few questions about that. And then we added a few questions about whether they had been to a post-ICU clinic or not, and, and some circumstances surrounding that visit. And this is the result. Um, this is a book. Uh, it's 300 questions uh, regarding ICU survivorship. And what we did after that, what we're doing right now is we're conducting a pilot study when we have sent this, this book, or this questionnaire, to 600 ICU survivors. Uh, and we're currently uh, using it on 300 controls. Um, one of the most interesting stuff about this is the current response rate, and this is within the ICU survivor group. We have a response rate of 80% for these 300 questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm about to show you some preliminary data from this, and there's three things I should mention before. First of all, we're not going through all the 300 questions. I'm, I'm, we're not doing that. Uh, the second thing is that you have to remember that the data I'm about to show you is just on the, the ICU survivor, the patient group. We don't have the data from the controls yet, so I, can, I can't say what is significant or not. We just can't say, say that yet. And the third thing is that every question 
has the time frame of the past month. So this has nothing to do with how they felt when they were discharged. And as you might remember from my previous slide, we asked them the included patients were discharged from six months up to three years ago. And this is how they, how they are doing right now. So, as, as Patik and you all have said, we know, for, for example, in the cognitive domain, that they have uh, difficulties when it comes to language, they have difficulties when it comes to executive functions, getting started, finishing tasks, they need checklists for everything they do, uh, they are haunted by fatigue, um, and to the extension that they have to, uh, or they choose to isolate themselves. The general fitness is really bad for the most part. Uh, they can, for example, walk stairs. Uh, they have leg weakness. Uh, they are in pain to the extent that pain actually prevents them from having a normal social life. We also added on every chapter, we, we ended with a kind of a, a composite questions. For example, in pain, we ended with a question saying that when it comes to pain and your troubles with pain, how much does that affect your quality of life? So we have like, like a chapter composite questions on these areas. And for example, as you can see, when it comes to pain, uh, it really truly affects your quality of life. They are not surprisingly feeling low. Uh, and the other three are, are, questions are quite interesting. Emotional incontinence, this was one of my, my interviewees told me. She had the example of not being able to watch a Disney movie with a granddaughter because she got too angry and too happy and too tearful just from watching a Disney movie. She could start crying for missing the bus. And that's what, what she, she um, called being emotionally incontinent. The two bottom ones are the inability to feel love towards your family members. And the last one is the inability to remember what you felt towards your family members. And as you can see, the prevalence isn't that high, but if you think for a second what these questions actually means, it means having a part of your family that doesn't remember loving your kids or partner or whatever. And if they do remember, not being able to, to show this feeling or actually feel them. So when it comes to, this, to, the, uh, to the family, this is an emotional disaster for the families that affected by this. They are uncomfortable with hugs, and that, that comes from, when you ask them about that, it comes from every time someone gets close to you, it means pain. It means they're going to put an A-line in. It means, as someone said, that there was a specific nurse that washed their hair with cold water. So when someone gets close, it means it's going to hurt, uh, which means years later that they can't even hug their kids because they associate this with pain. Some of them have stigmatizing scars, and the question actually is whether they are embarrassed to show themselves naked in front of their partner because of the scars. And as you can see, it's almost uh, it's over 10% that, that uh, bother, is bothered by this. They don't have a sexual desire anymore, and their sex life is just disastrous. 15% of these patients have moved since they were discharged from the ICU, and of those who moved, about half of them had to move because of a new handicap stemming from the, the, uh, the diagnosis that put them in the ICU. Oh, sorry, too fast. Not surprisingly, the household economy is affected and only half of the patients that had a job think that they can have the same job within two years from now. So the next step with using this this uh, questionnaire is, of course, to reduce the number of items. We are doing that as soon as we have the control groups. We're going through various, as you probably know, factor analysis, psychometric analysis, all this, just to reduce the number significantly. Um, and the end product of that would be an ICU-specific questionnaire uh, ready for translation, further validation, creating scoring systems, but something that is actually validated in comparing controls, healthy controls, I should say, uh, to ICU survivors. And how could you use this? Well, of course, a questionnaire like this would be useful in your everyday post-ICU clinic as an evaluation tool, but it's also, also useful within all kinds of interventional studies. My 
key point, my main key point, is that we have to start listening to what they actually want to tell us. We haven't really been doing that up until now, but we have to do that. And with that, I will thank you for your attention, and anyone who feels like collaborating or discussing these issues are free to send me an email, and I'm open for questions with that. Thank you for your ambitious work. <laughs> I have seen this book and yeah, <laughs> it's very good. Uh, what was the most unexpected thing that you found that you think it's new, that you were not expected that these survivors should report in such an extent? Well, the most, I could say that the most unexpected thing was 80% response rate. Uh, <laughs> I, I agree. But, 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 <laughs> I but then again, it, it, that just tells us that we actually I think that's a, a part of the validation. It tells us that we ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. Things that no one has asked them before. Not in primary care, not in the ICU clinic, maybe not the family members. Mm -hmm. uh, I must say that when, you, when I compare the different chapters, um, I'd say that, for example, the cognitive domain, as uh, Pratik has shown us, was not, the problems were not as high as I expected. It might be, I mean, we had three years as long as one, you had up to one year, it might be something like that. So I was kind of surprised that it wasn't as bad as I thought. Um, that was one of the, the unexpected things. But I think maybe the massiveness of the troubles they have at all, uh, in itself is, is the most, at least horrifying <laughs> findings. We, we don't know yet if, if, the, uh, if the same patients have all the troubles uh, or if it's spread out mm -hmm. to different. Of course, we'll analyze it. We don't know that yet. It should be interesting to see what the families report if they report the same, for example, for cognitive problems that was yeah. reported by the patient. Exactly. I case. agree. I agree. Next study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was amazed by your response rate on 80%. Thank How you. did you manage? What did you, what did you do? Um, we we start, well, we had a, an organization where we first sent them a letter about the, the trial and telling them that you will be receiving a phone call, we will be inviting you to this study. That was like the information about the study. And then within a few days we called them and, and we had a specific study nurse who called them and, and talked about the study. And then it was just basically we gave them a few weeks to finish this and we just called them and called them again. <laughs> uh, and it was we're pretty we told them that, that, that there's no hurry about doing this. We have a question because, I mean, it's so massive. Um, we actually, in the chapter about the questionnaire, we, ha we have some questions about uh, how long time did it take? Did you get any help? And if so, from whom? Uh, so I think it might even be publishable <laughs> compared to how, how they regarded the questionnaire in itself. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a good presentation. I would like to ask how long time after ICU do you l send these questionnaire package for the patients? Three years. Three years. Yeah. So they have some recovered the some. Uh, sorry. What? They have recovered some. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I should say six months to three years. Okay, six So there's a span that we haven't analyzed yet. And once we get to do a prospective study, we can actually study the trajectories for different chapters. What happens with the cognitive dysfunction? Does that peak at certain level and then declines? And what, happen, what happens when, when uh, let's say, for example, the psychological pr uh, troubles they go through? Within a year or two, when you can't return to work, does that peak again? Uh, so we, we need to, to do that prospectively, follow the trajectories of the different areas. Thank you. We have two questions from the audience, but I don't know if we have time. No, we don't. But uh, you are very welcome to ask you one after Absolutely. this session, the questions. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.